in uh, Hong Kong right now, and uh, we're going to be doing the tech here in our room that we've rented. And yeah, this place is small. It's very small, but we have 500 up, 500 down. Yeah, that's it's it's the very large, spacious, fancy, magical room, crappy internet, or this. Yeah, and someone asked, you know, hey, are, are you guys like not getting enough sponsorship money, or what's going on? Why do you guys always stay in these crappy little places? I think the word actually was, why do you guys always stay in such a shitty little place? When, you know, other YouTube teams, I'm not going to mention names, but people have seen it on Twitter, stay in, like, lavish resorts and whatnot. Uh, everything I have to say to respond to this is so vulgar, I'm just going to deter to you for the official response. All right, the official response is that when we go to a different place, we like to get a sample of the local culture because that all goes into the products that they make, the companies that they are all involved in. All of that is something... Um, that works together to bring you the products that you guys use at home or the products that you may never use at home like this that we picked up at a you know street market and that that we picked up at the where were we at the Sh it was um, the the Sh uh, I'm gonna butcher it it's the <laughs> Sham Shui Po Sham Shui Po? Uh, Sham Shui Po it's it was the the computer they call it an arcade but it's not a it's not an arcade it's a uh, probably a hundred thousand different things video games monitors 4k monitors yeah, they Bluetooth had, devices, cords, cables. Yeah, they had cords, cables, HDMI cables. They had these babies. They had. Uh, it, it, I ha I picked up. Um, I picked. These are the coolest things. They're 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 the three pronged adapter cables you get for your the Mickey Mouse you, plugs. Yeah, from Mickey Mouse to like a, the regular computer plug. It was like this is awesome. So, <laughs> uh, I snagged up a bunch of those. We picked up a couple of the random knickknacks. I mean, it was it was pretty cool. Uh, it was a lot. We spent almost two hours walking around the store, not even just just looking. Yeah. Two hours. It was that big. I mean, we're already on a tangent, but the bottom line here is that we want to get the complete picture, and I mean, I also prefer the more authentic stuff to the whole, like, hey, let's keep you guys in a bubble. A lot of business people come here, a lot of different YouTube channels come to a, different, a lot of different places, and they stay inside their Western bubble or their comfort bubble, and I think that's a very stupid way to do things. And um, yeah. I, I'm not going to come out and condemn them. Some people don't like to get their hands dirty. Some people are afraid of local culture some people don't know they don't know how to, they don't want to try the local food or anything like or that they, they freak out with the language barrier bottom line I think is that we did not travel to the other side of the planet to experience the exact same kind of stuff I would experience in New York and it's very shocking that you can if you want to we did especially venture in into, yeah we did venture into a couple of places here I'm like this feels like Soho oh wait it's Actually we're, called Soho. We're in Soho, Hong Kong. Yeah. And it, it felt like Soho, New York. And then we took a wander like we literally we walked six blocks one direction and feel I felt like I was in Tribeca. And then we got on a train and took it a few stops and suddenly it felt like well, it felt even more authentic local Hong Kong than you would find in like Chinatown, which was Yeah, which it's was like we're awesome. back we're finally back in Hong Kong. It's a weird place and of all the places we've been so far we've been to Beijing. Um, and you guys will see the full video. Uh, we went to Shenzhen. Uh, we went to which is just just it's not that far away from here. Shenzhen is like ride. yeah, it's like a forty minute train ride. I think that's your ride. Yeah, well, I gotta go hang yeah. out with the. We gotta get out of here soon because we've turned off the AC for you guys. Yeah. Um, so we'll have a big video uh, coming up soon. We're gonna make some mouse pads, and we went to Dongguan mm -hmm. to look around at some mouse pads. That's what we did. Mouse pads, yeah. yeah. Was and a, that was a that was a cool that was a cool trip. It was a lot of fun. We using this one right now, it's microfiber. This yeah. It's, this is the coolest thing is that this uh, it's it's made out of the same microfiber cloth you can use to you know fix your glasses. Yeah, so. you can clean your glasses, clean your monitor with it if you like. So we're thinking about going microfiber. It's a little bit more expensive. It's nice and smooth. The tracking is really good. We've been playing video games, but the tracking is you know totally fine with me. Um, so I want to know what you guys think of microfiber. It'll be fully printed with you know some kind of a cool thing. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, one of these things, I don't know. And, uh, yeah, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Um, and then there's also the regular fabric, which you guys have seen and used before. We're going to do the, the, the threading around the edges, you know, to make sure it's rigid, or not rigid, or sturdy. Yeah, I, I, I can't say that. I have some really old mouse pads that they peel, so I was like, no, let's get the stitching. At least it'll, it might, it might curl the pad a little bit, but I, it won't peel the, the fabric off, which I think is, is a better, that's, it's the six and one hand, half dozen in the other. And you know something really funny? We're going to be getting our uh, mouse pads from the same source as a bunch of major companies that sell you mouse pads for 40, 50 bucks. Yeah. I was really excited. To we be got there and I was like, like hey, hey, look at all these. And they're, and at first of all, I was like, oh, they just made these fake ones to put them on the shelf to show us. And then I went in the back and they are actively printing large batches of 
you know, mouse pads for these major companies. So I was like, oh, it's kind of eye opening when you get here. It's amazing what you can find when you open the phone book and be like, those guys look good. <laughs> it's really weird also to be here and you see that like a lot of the stuff in, in our countries and, uh, you know, in our country and other countries that is marketed and branded very differently. You go and it's the same guy putting different stickers on different products. And I, I, I know a lot of people out there would love to keep the wool over your eyes so that they can charge a lot of money and make their products look unique and special. And some are unique and special out there. But a lot of them are rebrands or made in the same factory or made by the same people and they just try to be different through marketing. So yeah. we'll be bringing you all of that video pretty uh, pretty soon. We were sponsored by Deepcool for Computex, so of course say thanks to them. Um, but they also brought us over to, to show us their factory. And one thing I thought was interesting about their factory is that they own everything. It's all theirs and they even make the molds for the plastic, they make everything in house. Like, so you saw them back there making the molds. That was actually probably one of the coolest things we saw. You know, we, we walk through the factory floor and we're like, hey, they're actually making the fan blades in, a, in an injection mold. It's like a really fancy 3D printer. It just does it all at once. It was, it was really cool. It's an injection mold. So they make that. And then we walk into another room and they're like, oh, this is where we actually make the molds that they're using over there. It was like, that's awesome. So guys, do be sure to thank our sponsors, Deep Cool, Corsair, MSI, and also special thanks uh, to Zotac and Intermax. We got a couple of special things going on with them, so that uh, Computex stuff will be coming up very soon. Now let's get down to the tech. You guys have been waiting for the tech, so let's get down to it. SourceForge. Now there's been a whole uh, m bunch of nonsense going on with SourceForge and GIMP. It's been going back and forth for a little while, and um, it it's kind of weird. So here's what happened, and then we can we can chat about this. Uh, SourceForge is a major website that has downloads for just about everything under the sun. It's not the official download location of GIMP, but they were using it as a mirror. Now, GIMP is the alternative software to Photoshop, and it's available on Linux and also Windows. I believe it's also for OS X. Yeah, you can um, get everything. Pretty much everything. And what happened is the guys from SourceForge decided they were going to take over the GIMP account rebrand it or repackage it and add a bunch of bloat like Norton antivirus and what else? Uh, there was some other just random I, 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 I read it and I was just like I, I, I've blocked them out of my mind because they're those programs that everybody's like why is this even bundled with this? And I think what annoys me the most about this is that it's you know there may not have been an update for the Windows version for the last year and a half which I think is what they, according to SourceForge, they said it was 18 months since the account's been inactive. So it's abandoned. So they've abandoned it, so they have gave it a refresh. And by a refresh, they mean they took the existing uh, executable and just stuck it in line with three or four other things. And it's just, it's just, I can't say it's malware, but it's it's definitely ad-supported. I don't know, man. Norton is, Norton is almost malware, in my opinion. It is so, well, it's... Even if it's doing something good, it harasses you so much and it insults your intelligence on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. It's yeah, ridiculous. It's, it's, I almost want to call this stuff like, it's bloatware, but I want to call it like annoyingware because it's stuff that does an actual job, but it's it's like having that assistant that's really helpful, but every single time they step in the room, you just want to strangle them because they're like, shut up, I get it, thank you, just leave the note here and get out. <laughs> leave my agenda, go away. That's that's what like Norton does. It's... I'm just going to be quick. But uh, Ola, right? They're a VPN thing that said, hey, you're going to get like a VPN-like service using just a Chrome extension and it's going to be free. So I know there's a lot of people out there looking for a free VPN. We get that all the time. Like, what VPN do you recommend? I usually go say Private Internet Access or Viper VPN. And you guys can go to techsyndicate.com forward slash tech support, T-E-K support. And we have our affiliate links there. Uh, thank you very much, by the way. Now, we're using Viper uh, as we're traveling across the country, but... Um, it's been very helpful. Yeah, really helpful, especially in China. The chameleon mode helped a lot. And then we get to Hong Kong, it's like... Oh, and oh, Hong Kong was like, what, fast internet to everywhere? And every website you want? Yeah, sure, great. Um, but anyway, everyone keeps coming and looking for, like, free VPNs, and the response is that, hey, guys, it's just a couple bucks a month to give you, like, an internet experience that is the way the internet should be, you know, like unmetered and you don't have to worry about people sending you copyright notices and you don't have to worry about people monitoring what you do on the internet so when I see anything free I immediately am just like yeah there's I'm, there's no way because you can't maintain something free it's impossible as the uh, the old economic saying goes there's no such thing as a free lunch 
And with this, yeah, I'm looking at this and I, I looked at it very, very briefly at it, and I actually think it acts more like a like a proxy server, but it's all done through like a backend extension, so it's not using a proxy, but it's it, the extension kind of bundles this proxy-like thing. Sort of approximately how it works. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, no, that's all in all reality. That's how we're using the VPNs at this point, anyway. But right. I digress. Uh, you, you're, you're looking at a, a free extension that's going to do something, and that doesn't. And there's something. There's always something weird about that. I, nobody is going to create something like this and have it be completely free. There's always a catch with with this kind of software. And you know what? If it actually is free and too good to be true, and it's working, it's probably run by the government. There's my tinfoil hat moment for the day. Uh, this one here, however, happens to have. Uh, I, th I think. I don't think it was that it was. They were bundling this, and it was being. They're just using this. people's traffic to DDoS other people and I, stuff I like that. that. They're using it to do crazy things. I think that the way that this thing was using is it was actually using your internet connection to proxy other people's internet connections and it was kind of creating this giant mesh everybody's talking from everywhere but instead of having a uh, instead of having like a centralized uh, data spec point like a proxy would actually be I think this was doing some kind of like a mesh proxy which was really weird but then you would end up somebody was somebody was using it as a botnet which to, to, to basically charge a bunch of DDoS attacks. It was, it was, it's, uh, I see these things and my brain blows like several fuses and I have to reset them. It's, it's, it's annoying. Anyway, we'll leave that alone for now. Um, Read that article. That one's... And just don't, don't use free stuff, man. I mean, it, come on. It's, it's silly. So, next up, Elon Musk's uh, Hyperloop. That's the super fast train that, like, operates in a vacuum. Uh, they're, they're building it right now in California, like a small version of this. They're, they're working on it. They don't have all the investors yet, but they're crowdfunding some of it. Anyway, they're talking about how much it's going to cost um, to run this, and the what was it? The uh, the price pricing consultants estimate that it should cost around twice the price of a plane ticket. Now, I'm not sure if that's how much it's going to cost to run the thing, but it doesn't sound like it's actually going to cost that much to run and maintain it. What, what, you know, it's one of those. This is one of those very interesting statements. Is they say they, they talk to a bunch of pricing consultants, and a pricing consultant is a person who is hired to say. This is a product, it falls into this kind of category, so it's, it's a public transportation, it's going to get you from point A to point B, and, or point A to point Z in some cases, because it's, it, it's designed to be really long distance, fast, reliable travel, so you look at an airplane, how long does it take to get to the airplane, on the plane, across the country, into the other airport, out of the thing, get your luggage and go. And then you can look at this, and it's going to be faster than this. And they're going to say, well, if this costs this much, and this is what the overhead is, this should cost this much. Even though the overhead may be dirt nothing, and it's all, and that that's that's just a marketing thing. That that I, I don't even buy into that because if you look at Elon Musk and he's not even he doesn't even buy into that. He's like I don't want it to be excessively expensive. I want to change the world and I want to give people a new way to get from point A to point B that's uh, efficient, uh, green, and you know less pollutant. I mean, that that sounds. Yeah, he seems that sounds to be amazing. he seems to be more focused on where humanity should be. I mean, focused to the point of almost insanity, but that might be what we need. A lot of the, a lot insanity of people who is relative. Yeah, a lot of the people who have made the biggest changes in the world in general throughout history have been insane. And there's these fucking insane is a legal term. I would like to refer to them as eccentric. <laughs> you have to be very wealthy before you're eccentric. Well, he's before, wealthy. <laughs> before that point, you're uh, deranged or uh, quirky. That's like if you're artistic, you're quirks. Never mind. We won't even get we won't get into the different levels of. Uh, Isentricity. Dude's a loon, and I'm. <laughs> got a, I've got a heart for that. Well, I mean, he wants to make it free. So here's the deal: the Hyperloop is going to be using renewable energy, and it's actually going to be producing more energy than it needs to run. That's pretty crazy. And so it's going to be putting energy back in the system. They can sell it like that, and then you know get some get some money back. They are trying to figure out other ways to monetize it because I think Elon Musk wants it to be a way to change the way we do things. Uh, he, there, there probably is going to be like a, 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 I guess peak pricing. So during peak hours, there'll be a, you know, a, a and price for that. Yeah, and that's just to deter a, a mass flux to it. And, and, and not the other thing is, while the device itself may be very, very cheap to put people from point A to point B, you still have to have people that's running it. It's still going to have people in the back end. So it has to be monetized in some way, shape, or form, so that we can, you know, pay the people that are operating the device. Yeah, we've got to do something. I, I think that we're going to end up with a similar to like a metro card or the octopus here in uh, Hong Kong. Just Google octopus Hong Kong and you'll get an idea of what it is. 
where you have a card or, or some sort of a you know method and it's cheap and, and I think we're that everyone's going to end up paying just it'll uh, that's what I think but it'll be cheap like I mean, a, like a metro card yeah and I mean just I'm imagine this being like retrofitted into a subway system like we've got here in Hong Kong or a public transportation system in New York I mean it may or may not operate I don't know um, but for long distances this would be great and it would be awesome to be able to live in I don't know live in Arizona and work in New York depending on the time it takes if it's if it turns a, a cross country commute into like two hours I would consider living in one area of this country and then jumping on one of these and working in another. I wouldn't mind having a two-hour commute if I just could sit down and do nothing. Could be cool. All right, next up. I'm going to start going fast because I want to get to the camera market. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Google is now allowing you to, I guess... Turn by turn navigation yeah. offline? Yeah. So I haven't used this yet, uh, or I, don't, I, I hope to be able to use this. I mean, it's one of those things where I picture this as you say, I need to go from point A to point B, you hit offline, it downloads the map and it downloads how to get there and all that one. No, again. no, it doesn't do that though. No? Nope. It's just gonna, you, you have to set up your area and that's what you get. Yeah. So, it wouldn't be good for people like us who travel a lot. We'd have to like constantly be downloading new areas or changing our area. That's so, kind of lame. Yeah, at least that's the way I'm, I'm seeing it here. It's, that would be cool. Okay, so, uh, point of note, the better way to do this is I lay in a course from wherever I am to wherever I want to go I hit offline and it downloads the route and the all the information it takes to get from point A to point B. And if you're doing this cross country, just make sure you have a lot of data to to, to download all that stuff. Get a bigger memory card or something. Yeah, that's what I, I want. I want you know what thirty gigabytes put it on a memory card, and then we can just not worry about it. That's what I want. But yeah, go everywhere. Yeah, got it. It's getting warm in here. We've got to hurry up. It's all it's unbearably hot in in Asia in general right now. Yeah, it's but Hong Kong. Oh my God. Taipei is gonna never mind. Let's talk about AT and T because they are doing something pretty ridiculous. They want to be, you know, well, they want to choose what video apps count against your data cap. So they're gonna roll out data caps. That's already bad enough, right? Well, and, I think we have, this is this is now is this this is where it gets funky. Is this specifically for like wireless services or is this for uh, your home internet work services? Well, right now it looks like it's well, it's probably gonna be for everything. They're rolling out data caps on on pretty much everything. And the other thing that they're doing is, is they're switching a lot of people's home service to 4G antennas on the roof. So when they do this sort of thing, it's going to be for all the services. That's just, I mean, it may not be immediately for all the services, but they are rolling out data bandwidth caps. Cox to their home is rolling out data bandwidth caps. Comcast to the home, rolling out data bandwidth caps. And if AT&T is successful in allowing certain services to not count against the data bandwidth cap, therefore prioritizing that over all the other services, if, if that works, then all the other companies are going to go for it. They're going to make you pay extra for, well, not Netflix. It's just that you'll have to, Netflix will count against your bandwidth cap. Or, you know, like right here with, with, um, this is revisiting AT &T. the exact same crap we did right before all the net neutrality stuff happened. It was the, uh, there's a fast lane and the hyperspeed lane. Yeah. And the people who are paying for the hyperspeed lane are the companies such as Netflix, Hulu, uh, YouTube, all that jazz. They're, they're going to be charged or they're going to be given the opportunity to pay more money to allow their customers to not uh, to, uh, to allow their customers to watch their stuff exclusively without any uh, issues. So that's what that's what Hulu has already done here. Hulu is paying AT and T so that they can have priority service and not be counted against your bandwidth cap. Already happening. And Netflix has not done that now, so Netflix will count against it. People are going to be more incentivized to use Hulu. And now we've got the whole net neutrality debate back and forth. But, you know, AT&T, they looked at the whole thing, and the the FCC was not clear about bandwidth caps at all. They were like, oh, we'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis. So that's what they're basing this on, was the basis of the case-by-case -case basis. Let's put this in stasis and move on. All right. Let's talk about Sprint. The death of unlimited data. Hmm. So they, they really, 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 all these companies hate unlimited data. It, it's bad for them. Well, you know, we always talk about how these data data transmissions are are, are virtually infinite, and it's yet yeah, you have to remember that it costs X amount of money to run a single switch, and when you're running it at full capacity, that's a lot of electricity being used to generate the poor traffic. I mean, so there is a cost that goes into it. I think that the cost that goes into this is a hell of a lot lower than these guys make it out to be. Well, yeah, that, and they've also been incentivized by government grants and everything else too expand and a lot of times all they need to do to expand is add more ports back at home base they don't actually need to run 
yeah. anything physically to the home. They just need to add another rack or two or three. A, a back end connectivity. Yeah, and, and that's it. Again, but that, that again, that costs, it's cost for the, the individual switch, it costs for the electricity running it. I'm, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here only because I want to see that this isn't completely one-sided. I just think that these companies are skewing it in such a way when they're looking at it, it boils down to these big companies, it's, I can only sell so much of any given service. And once you get to that capacity, how do you improve profit margins? You have to cut costs. This is one of those methods of doing it. You're cutting costs by saying you can only use so much, and then after that we charge you more. And that's, that's, that happens across the board, everything from from your your you know your your bleach that you're using for your laundry detergent all the way down to these computers and whatnot. You can only sell so many units of any given thing, and then you have to cut costs in some way, shape, or form to improve profit margins. Well, I mean, we, we we know that they're mostly hoarding a lot of this money so that they can just buy each other instead of upgrading. They're trying to buy each other. That's mainly what I see going on. Like, let's consolidate down, buy the competition, and then yeah. board of directors for company A and board of directors for company B. We're getting bored, so how about you guys buy us? We can go about our merry way, take all of this massive cash because we own the majority share of these companies, and then go and live on an island somewhere, and then, then we're just left with one company, and, you know. That's the way it works. Okay. Speaking of these yeah. kinds of practices. <laughs> Comcast revenge, so apparently there's, there's some revenge. Like the main thing, I, I, they're, they're raising prices. They always raise prices at a, at a rate way greater than the rate of inflation. The thing I wanted to talk about uh, most here is there is a report out by quartz, whatever that is. And um, they're saying that Comcast is in negotiations to buy Vox Media. Now, Vox Media owns The Verge, Recode, Polygon, some crappy sports site, some site for guys who like things on the internet. I don't know. They're, they have a lot of different things, but the bottom line here is The Verge has been, they've been very, very vocally against Comcast and Verizon and the way that they've handled net neutrality and our data and all that sort of thing. So that happened. Verizon purchased AT, I mean, uh, uh, okay. AOL, AOL, which owns Huffington Post, and mm -hmm. uh, Verizon's been purchasing other websites as well, TechCrunch, and they've been telling them that, hey, from now on, guys, you guys can't use phrases like net neutrality. We're going to talk about just good old-fashioned technology, and we're not going to get into this whole debate on whether or not you know, throttling your data is bad, so just, that's what they're doing. They're buying up the media. These are not random Joe Schmo media sites. These are, well, well I, we, I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm taking the liberty in saying this. These are reputable sites that have a history of producing content that we have a certain level of trust for. And suddenly they're going to be owned by... This is going right back to uh, John Oliver's dingo reference, where you know, <laughs> the dingo is actually getting married to the, the chickens in the hen house. And we're going to think this is all going to be okay. The analogy breaks down somewhere, but besides the point, this is a very so Pretty soon we're going to have a bunch of dingoes and chicken costumes running around? Uh, I don't know what this means. Or maybe the chicken... Yeah, that's probably how it's going to work. No, that's exactly how it's going to work. We've got... It, it, this this is this is. I do not believe that a company that has a vested interest in an industry should be owning the industry that reports on it. That's your opinion. This is why this is why most of your big news organizations are kind of going down the dogs, dogs not. I mean the do <laughs> dogs not. Dogs not is some terrible <laughs> stuff. If you ever had a dog that just runs its nose, it's gross. You have to clean it. It gets all over the place. It is a terrible thing. That's what these these big companies. That's why. Really, how? When was the last time you actually trusted Fox News, if ever? Yes. Exactly. If if Vox is sold, The Verge is dead. They'll be doing their. You can go there and probably get the same quality of review as for like phones and that sort of thing, as long as the you know, as long as Comcast is happy with the phones. But for all the rest of it, all the activism, all the you know, really all of good the reporting, actual journalism, it's dead. It's going to be either dead or it's going to be cherry picked, to where you're going to see only only the things that are irrelevant or the things that are no longer relevant to the like these specific topics at hand. And, I mean, we're going to still be here because they're not going to buy us. I don't care how much money they have. 
which yeah. means we need better sources because a lot of the stuff we do is we get stuff from all of these different sources. But we're going to have to. We're, I mean, we could generate the news ourselves. That's what it's going to end up need, becoming. I would need a staff, and I hate journalism myself. I'm just not a journalist. I like to common comment on things that are happening and have a have a voice that way and encourage everyone to go out and do some research. I just I'm not a journalist. I'm more of a creative. So I want to yeah, make my music and make my movies and be left alone and uh, actually going out and getting this stuff and calling these people, I'd, I'd rather just drive to their house and punch them in the face rather than call them and ask them, Sir, what's happening with this meeting on Tuesday? Can I, can I, you know, like, no, I, I, can I get something for our blog? No, I, I just, I don't work that way. We would need a few people to help us with that. Maybe they're out there. So far, all the, all the, me. so far a lot of the writers are either really busy that we've hired or the ones that are not busy seem to have like first grade level gram, you know, grammar skills, so. I've had a couple that are, are interesting, but it's if we have to we have to be able to vet some of these people to make sure that their their articles aren't they're <laughs> precise and to the point, and they're not just a bunch of fluffware. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. It's the oh my god, everything's happening. It's the peaking, the peaking duck. I know, I know. It was peaking, delicious. It was, uh, it was great. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Anyway, but yeah, <laughs> you know. Anyway, moving on. We'll talk later. You know what? Let's. let's, 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 let's yeah. No. It's got a hardware. I've screwed no, You know what? That, no, I just want to. I don't want to go into that article too much, but this is something that, that you, you, I think needs to be this mentioned. One? This right here was somebody built an app, or sorry, sorry, somebody built a website where you could feed Facebook Messenger data into and map out all of their activity. Because every single time you have a conversation with Facebook Messenger on your phone, it sends your geographic location. So you Either, can, even if it's turned off. Well, no, you, can turn, it right. you can turn it off, but when you have a conversation, it defaults to on. So when you, when you have that conversation on your phone, you can grab the chat history out of your phone and pump it into this API and map out somebody else's movements based on the conversations you have with them. Move on. You can look into that one yourself. All right, I'll give you guys a quick preview of what Zotac's going to have. It's going to be awesome. Possibly a Computex. These little Z-boxes, I've liked what they've been doing a lot, and um, the thing I'm really, really liking about these is that they're offering some bare bones solutions. Uh, these things are tall, uh, tiny, tall. It's standing, uh, standing tall. There, they're tiny. Um, the newest versions for Display Ports for USB 3, dual gigabit Ethernet. They're uh, not extremely fast as far as the CPU goes. They're AMD APUs. But they're, they're not, they're not exactly, seven. yeah, but these things are not designed to be like giant gaming machines. These are designed to be like, uh, put this in a as a display machine, so this is the device that's going to run four yeah. displays. I mean, it's got, uh, it's got the dual gigabit Ethernet. You could do a lot with that. You could okay, you can get the bare bones. It does not have the uh, no no RAM, no storage, no OS. So you could put whatever OS you want on there. Put every, you know whatever components you want on the inside. And the thing that's really cool about this, with some of the new uh, options out there, maybe stream from Steam to this device. If it's a Linux machine, you can have your big machine in the other room. Use it as streaming, use it for other services for streaming, use it to play video games, use it for uh, perfect for ROMs and that sort of thing. So I might want to grab one of these for the living room. I would be interesting to soon. see if it would work for those those kinds of applications. But I mean for the most part it's got four it's got four up to four K outputs. So you can it can drive four individual four K outputs. Which again like I said it's it's really good if you want to put this as a in a media space where you're 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 showing off something and you need to show four different displays because you're showing off a product. I mean, it, it's... I can see a, a commercial uh, uh, purpose for this. Yeah. We'll check that out at Computex plus a lot of other things, so stay tuned for that. everybody. All right. Okay, this is pretty crazy. The new Xeons. 28 cores with six memory channels and TDP of only up to 165 watts. So that's just, I mean, this is a, a leak, of course, and there's not much to comment on other than the fact that, hey, we just heard about the Zen architecture from AMD, and that sounded pretty crazy, and then here's Intel with up to 28 cores and six memory channels. So they, I think they leaked it because people were talking about Zen too much, and they were like, stop it. We, we need to get our foot back in the, hey, hey, look at me, look at me. Though at the same time, this is, this is specifically for the Xeons, and I think the reason you can do it with a Xeon is because, you, you know, they've been really shrinking down the die and what happens if you just double the size? Of, you know, you're going down to these what 14 nanometer chips now, mm -hmm. and then you can just leave the 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 actual have a wafer CPU. the same size as we have now. But you just cut the actual space that each core takes up by you know a third. Suddenly you can cram a bunch more in there, and they've probably just figured out how to make them all talk to each other. But this would be great for a really awesome blade system. Uh, I mean, I could this this is this is what drives the internet. 
these kinds of chips. I, I want to see what trickles down into the you know standard consumer stuff because if we can get some maybe 16 core parts in the consumer area, that'd be amazing. Not so much for gaming, but for productivity and and that sort of thing. You know maybe a uh, maybe a, not not a Xeon part, but you know just like an i7. With, yeah, a with high end i7 cores. for a workstation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, also looking at the fact that you can get at this many cores and a really low power usage, we're looking at a, a really low heat output, or maybe it's going to be a high heat output. Now, usually when it's really low, low wattage output, it's it's usually lower heat, and you can control the heat a little more. You can find this kind of stuff in a laptop, like this this machine here that we're using. Indeed, it's like a workstation laptop. Quite enjoy this machine. We're running a, a Linux right now to do the capture, so it's been working just fine so far. Yeah. All right, moving right along here. Uh, Huawei. Is it Huawei? Huawei. Huawei? Huawei. Huawei. I'm going to say Huawei. And Audi. And Audi. Or Audi. <laughs> Audi. It's Audi. Huawei and Audi. Audi. Sounds like... Uh, anyway, they team up and connect the cars. This is... I can see really awesome purposes for this. I mean, this is this is a really great idea. Imagine, uh, you know, you've got that 16-year-old that you, for some reason, let drive the Audi, and uh, you can track their right? every movement. Yeah. Track all their movements to make sure they don't crash the car. I mean, connected cars are very interesting because once you get into Shit. it, <laughs> let's see how that did. Hey, it still works. Our night market twelve dollar mouse still works. It mm -hmm. dropped on the floor. This was a tile floor. Oh yeah. So anyway, so uh, next time tile by fire. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it did pass this tile. All right. Um... May I continue? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got more puns. <laughs> more, more puns? But, yeah. The Punisher has returned. Uh, where was I? Oh, anyway, so connected cars, uh, I can see a lot of really positive purposes behind this. You get a car, it can connect up and say, hey, uh, you can maybe connect to, to, can connect to the cloud, and you can get all your music in your car without having to, to plug in a device. That would be kind of awesome. Uh, it, can, it can tell the dealership that you're all of the information that you need or when it's, you know, engine check engine light comes on, it can actually... Oh, so they can start bothering you to be like, hey, come back, come in here. They're, they're going to use this as advertising. Oh, well, no, they're they're everything that, right, it's going to end up doing that, and it's yeah. going to end up being like a pester machine. But at the same time, that's <laughs> kind of good. You know, when, you, when, you, when you've got somebody who doesn't know anything about cars, they've got my check engine lights on, guys got to plug into the computer, they got to figure out what's going on. Well, if the person pulls up, and this is Audi, so you're, it's not like it's, we're dealing with like a low-end really cheap car, this is an expensive car, you're going to be able to pull into the dealership, it's going to sync up with, with the dealership's mm -hmm. uh, computers and tell the dealership, this is what's wrong with me, this is how you need to fix me, do do what you need to do. And then the mechanic uh, can just basically read the printout, it doesn't have to plug into the computer and read the computer, it's already done for them. Uh, so it just cuts out that little bit. And then the, the, the dealership won't be guessing as to what's wrong. The car will already. Know. Oh, they want to do as many di diagnostics. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see a lot of positive yeah. purposes behind this, but this is also one of those side effects of having a computer that's running your car, and this has already been proven that this is a bad thing. Now, granted, the only recorded instance of uh, a malicious car hacking, uh, whatever, was done by a disgruntled employee. But if he can do it, he's got the keys to the city. Uh, you just need somebody who has a really good lockpick set. That's all you need. And that, yeah. That's an analogy for any kind of computer uh, malicious functionality when it comes to a computer. If this car is run by a computer and you can send a signal to the computer to tell the car to shut off, all you have to do is bypass the barriers to get into it. So this is the Consumer Reports. Uh, they're calling to pressure members of Congress to put a tighter knit regulation on car companies who are doing this computer stuff so we can have a tighter security on your car by whatever means necessary. I think we would be stupid to assume that things are going to be just smooth and flawless when we switch over to driverless cars or connected cars, either one of those two. And I think when you put the two together in five or six years, there's going to be a lot of problems. There's going to be crashes based upon hacking more than anything else. There's going even to be it, even if it's just a disruption. What, what if what if the computer in the car is queuing up some kind of GPS data via the cellular network or whatnot, and somebody just blasts an interference signal? So the, suddenly the car just thinks it's five feet to the left. It's going to have to deal with the sensors on the car. It's going to deal with where it thinks it actually is physically on the road. It may drive off the uh, wrong off-ramp. It may, like, oh, this is whatever. And it may just stop because it doesn't know what's going on. It'll crap out on you. That's... This reminds me of 
a, an old anime from like 98, 99 is when I think I first saw it. It was called EXD, Extra, it was like X Driver or Experienced or Expert Drivers and it was about Japan had moved to a point where all cars were automated in that same context. You get in the car, you give it your destination, it takes you there. Every now and again, one of the cars would glitch out. Uh, the artificial intelligence would go haywire and it would just high speed drive down the road. All the other cars would be like, oh crap, crazy car on the road, and they would pull over and wait. And then the ex-drivers were called in to basically pursue the car and blast its sensors to have the car go into, oh crap, I'm boxed in, shut down crash mode, and it would like deploy airbags and just stop in the middle of the road. Then they take the car out of commission and then you know, fix it. But it's all tied into the one big central network. It's a great anime. Anyway, go look at so, it. So that's on, what I see. On, on that same note, we need we we're gonna need some extra drivers. We're gonna need some precautionary measures. Measures. We're gonna need to prepare for when things go wrong and not only try to prevent them. Of course, you try to prevent things, but they're going to happen. And the other thing that we need to do as a society and as humanity, we need to prepare for the idea of a machine being in control. And I know it's really freaky for some people, but even with the accidents, even with the potential for hacking, it's still going to be much safer to let the machines and the robots and the cars do all of the work. If you remove the human element, the roads get a lot safer. And that is just the way it's going to be, but it's not going to be comfortable because it just feels weird for a lot of people to, to, you know, to, to allow a machine to take them from A to B and, ha and not having control. You know, that's just people are control freaks, but we need to understand when something has surpassed our ability as humans, it's time to let it take over. Now, that's scary. I'm going to I'm going to have a brief devil's advocate moment, but to be fair, we already have systems in place. We already have machines driving us around in certain places. There are air trains that are just very simple tramways between like airports and other destinations, completely computerized. There's nobody actually on board. In New York, the JFK air train, I don't think there's a real person in there at all. And the reason I know this is because it glitched out one time was stuck at a station and technicians had to come open up, attach some devices to the computer, reboot it, do whatever it was they had to do. They closed up this panel that was like the brain of the, the tramway and then it went right back into service. But until then it was it would block the block the train pathways. But that entire machine is computerized. I think the tube in London is primarily computerized, but there is a conductor on board that is like pushing buttons. I, I, I don't quote me on that, but I, I believe for the most part the it's, system, it's automated. The system here in Hong Kong, I haven't noticed, but it seems automated. I haven't like noticed a driver. It's just so damn accurate and fast and on time that it seems automated. It must be. It, it does seem like it that. It seems. I'd, I'd like, I, I wish we'd looked into it beforehand, but my point is, is that this is already happening across the board. Right. Factories are completely automated. I believe the Amazon warehouse is completely computerized. Most of it. I mean, you still have there's still the, the human element controlled. is still still there. And my argument does not include full on artificial intelligence that's smarter than us. That's a totally different argument. This is. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't an want. Some, I don't for, want something making philosophical or theological decisions for us. I theological, want maybe. You know, uh, the, you know maybe. Yeah. Probably but more I, logical than a lot of the but, theological decisions we have here. Like, oh, he is different than us. Yeah. Kill him. Yeah, that, that's bad. Because that's they're just gonna be like, oh, you're not a robot. You do not believe what I believe. Let's kill. Into, that that's this is where the conversation always goes. And Stephen Hawking isn't a big fan of artificial intelligence either. So He's, he just wants to he. he He's just warning so that we take precautions. That's the main I, thing. I but think it's a this different is argument. It's totally different. This this is specific. specific, specific. <laughs> yeah, I can't even say it now. This is very specific um, intelligence in one area. So it's very simple artificial intelligence, and that's a different, uh, different argument entirely. And when it with these cars, with this specific function, it's not so much that we're looking at a, an automated car. That's where it's going to go. But with this. This article and this stuff, it's more about, oh, right, this article and this stuff, uh, it's, it's more about cars that we're still controlling and having someone else have access to turn the car off. Imagine driving down the highway at 65 miles an hour and your car just shuts off and you have no I mean, that control. That already happens with the, you know, a lot of the, the, the newer cars, the cops can just turn your car off. That's, that's the other part about this. Well, if the cops can do it, you can do it. Yeah. I can do it. It's just a matter of figuring out it's it's a, it's a reverse engineering of the process, and someone's going to do it. There is there's nothing on this planet where somebody says, "Hey, you can't do that," and somebody is not already trying to figure out how, how can I actually do that. I mean, hell, I mean, look at us. 
I get a remote control. What do I do? I take it apart and see what the insides look like. <laughs> I mean, we brought how does the this work? for the AC last night. Yeah, so we gotta fix it. But if we didn't know how to take it apart and figure it out, we, we're not gonna. Someone's always gonna do it. That's all I gotta say. Hope the Airbnb person is not watching. Yeah. Uh, the robot okay. article was there, but it's now in a stupid format. Yeah. Let's Personal. talk about let's talk about the uh, indoor gardens. Uh, this is just a quick mention. I'm, I'm kind of curious to know what you guys think. Um, in the Netherlands, and I did not know this, but the Netherlands is the second highest exporter of agricultural type things right behind the USA. So anyway, they've uh, developed these pretty interesting uh, indoor gardens where you stack them. They use far less water. Uh, they don't use a lot of soil, if any, so I'm trying to get away from soil in a lot of areas. And then they're only using a couple different wavelengths of light instead of the full spectrum. And things grow much faster that way. And um, it's just a totally different environment. And they say that stuff is so clean that you can just pick it and eat it immediately. You don't have to worry about anything else. It also stays away from the weather systems, like harsh weather and that sort of thing. So they say it's an extremely efficient way to grow things. So. I think that's probably going to be the future of growing things. Uh, I mean, I like the whole act of gardening is like a you know, sacred process, digging into the ground. But uh, well, I think I think you've you've got like a more traditional gardening sense. Well, I grew there, up in but, Kentucky. We had a garden and all that. And you know, I grew up in Alaska. We had the same kind of thing. You know, we used to have a strawberry patch in the front yard. But that that still had a it probably won't go away. Part of part of part of the 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 system and having this gardening kind of system is is that you know it's it's. Finding and dis you're disrupting and finding that balance with the nature around you. Hmm. This takes nature out of the equation and puts everything into a box, which I'm not saying is good or bad in reference to traditional farming and traditional whatnot, but I can see this being used in a spacecraft. I can see this being used in like a moon base. Mm -hmm. This immediately, as soon as you were saying this, reminded me of The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Heinlein. They grow wheat, wheat they grow grain underground, in, well, in, the, in the book, they grow wheat in underground caverns, uh, ice caves. So they use water in the ice caves, or, you know, use the ice to grow their, their grain underground on the moon. This could be used for that kind of functionality. Yeah, and uh, here's what I think. I think that in places like we are, I mean, China, they're trying to urbanize billions of people right now, and they, they want to get a lot of people who are living in the middle of nowhere and put them into these giant cities that they're building. Um, and, I mean, there's a million reasons why they're doing it, we won't get into that, but I think things like this could help to reduce the cost of shipping, you know, different fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Um, they could put these in the middle of town, they could turn the, the bottom floor into a giant farmer's market and have, think about that, think, think about like the bottom floor being like this huge food emporium, just massive, because everything here is on a, it's on a different scale. If you think that, uh, you know, in America that you're the biggest and the best, you know, you might be in some ways, but once you see the scale of the things that they build over here, your mind will be blown. And so I'm picturing like this huge thing the size of like the Shanghai airport full of fruits and vegetables and stands. And, there, and above that, a ginormous skyscraper full of food that's being grown. Another book uh, by Silverberg, Robert Silverberg, it's called The World Inside. And it's about uh, the world had moved to a point where when he wrote this book, it was he was trying to get away from all this dystopian futures and let's create a utopian future. Unfortunately, it still kind of has this dystopian feel to it, but people lived in these giant high-rises, the bottom floors are like industrial power and whatnot, and then you get up into the floors above that, that's the food production, everybody's a vegetarian, everybody drinks, because he drinks and eats uh, vegetables and such, because the way they were able to do this was they had to kill off all animal life on the planet. Uh, but humans live in these giant towers. There's people living, you know, they moved to Venus and they were able to do this there. But it's it's another really interesting book uh, referencing this kind of thing where you, you have a, a internal farm system and it's feeding no animals, man. Millions and billions of people. That's weird. I mean, remember what they said at the first place that we stayed in Beijing? We were talking about the place and they said that a house with no animals is the same, in, in, you know, in uh, Chinese, same word for prison. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Scary. Interesting. Anyway, moving yeah. right along. All right, moving right along here. What's what's next on the menu? Uh, oh yeah, Europa. So NASA is is spending a few billion dollars, and they're going to send a probe to Europa. It'll take about a year to get there, and the probe has lots of sensors. It's going to start doing some close flybys. And now, just just uh, pulling some data for for everyone's edification. What is Europa? Europa is a moon of Jupiter. It's an ice moon, and uh, the ice is probably 
10 to 20 uh, kilometers thick in certain points, and beneath that, it appears to there appears to be a salty ocean. They're not sure sure what exactly is on the core because we've done lots of flybys, and, and Europa also could be the spot in our solar system that has the greatest chance for life as we know it. Who knows? There could be life on Venus, you know, because. We, we keep we, we discovered life on the, the, the volcanic sulfuric vents in the bottom of the ocean and we we're like, well this is life that doesn't need sunlight. So I don't think our perspective on things can really encompass all the forms of life that may exist out there. But as far as you know we're concerned, as our limited understanding, as close this to could, the line to what you'd find on the commonplace. Yeah. So they're hoping that the that Europa could um, I don't know, maybe, maybe they'll find something, and, and they're going to be doing all kinds of different tests, and I think it's about time that we've explored Europa, uh, even if there's nothing there. They just go and it's like, oh, it's a, the big ocean full of nothing, it's probably full of these weird squid creatures, because I saw a Europa report, and that's just what happens in that movie. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's actually a pretty freaky, interesting movie, it's almost told like a documentary, and then it's weird. Um, I think I've given away too much shit. Spoiler alert before this, but now it's too late, so we're just going to keep going. Go back in time and erase your memory. Yeah. So yeah, I think that uh, Europa, I mean, I think it could be used to inspire younger generations when we really need that. We really need some of the younger generations to get into science instead of, um... What were they into? I don't even know. Jersey Shore? Yeah. That's... Yeah. We need more scientists doing stuff. That's what it boils down to. Yeah. So cool. All right, video gaming stuff. I've got a couple old things to talk about. Nothing new because you know everyone else is covering that. I'm really excited about this. <laughs> yeah, right. Here, this right here. I'm very excited about this. So the 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 dark mod came out, and that was it's not Thief, but it is like a pretty good spiritual successor to Thief. It's just a a mod you can grab and it download lots of different Thief levels. But this is the actual Thief Gold um, HD remake, and you look at it, and you may be like, it doesn't look very HD. You should go and see the original. This is um, quite an upgrade. The original was shockingly. Well, it's it's old. It, it, you, could, you could put it up higher than that, but <clears throat> yeah, it's it looks a lot better now. So that's cool. Also, Skywind, uh, the new trailer shows um, the the beginning part of of Morrowind. Skywind is um, I can't believe these guys uh, how much work they've done on this, but there we go. Just go ahead. Full screen it. Really a lot of work. So they took Morrowind, they put it into the Skyrim engine, and they're using the Skyrim combat engine as opposed to Morrowind's uh, kind of clunky, you know, hit roll to hit engine. I always thought those were weird in action games. Like you hit someone, but still behind the behind the scenes there's a roll to hit. So I always thought that a game that has roll to hit like Dungeons and Dragons or whatever should have been should be turn based. It just that it, makes it hurts sense. my brain. Yeah, but, that would make more sense. But they've taken it and, and made it action combat using the balance of the Skyrim engine. So it'd be full-on action combat. You hit something with your sword, it actually makes contact. How much damage it does will be based upon your skills and your abilities and powers and sword and all that sort of thing. But yeah, it's looking pretty good. That's looking really good and promising. And I think we're both doing a voice for that, right? Um, I, Maybe soon. I, I need to I need to revisit that. I keep meaning to sit down and record something, but I get so busy with <laughs> real work that I've never actually submitted the, the audio thing. I think the guy wants me to try to be a goblin or something. He wants me to get into one of these voices and be a little goblin kind of guy. And yeah. I'm going to sell you this really nifty thing and I'm going to stab you in the... So I'm... I don't know. I think I'm just working on my voice now. I, I think maybe an imperial, I don't know. Uh, I was like, no, I want, to be, I want to be an orc or nothing. An orc or nothing. Orc or nothing. Yeah. So, pretty much the whole episode, you guys are going to see a lot of footage coming up from uh, Computex. Um, and I'm always looking for feedback. Let us know what you guys want to see. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll go out to some more markets, and you guys have to see... You guys have to see the video in China and the video in Hong Kong. The stuff that we found, the different markets... And just all the different places we've been. We've been to some of the touristy places. We've been to some of the non-touristy places. And we've got video of almost everything. That's my new ebook reader. <laughs> what is this? It, it's, it's got paper. It's the most fascinating ebook reader ever. It actually feels like a real book. It's amazing. Yeah. Really? Oh, I can't read it. I, I like this little controller. It was 12 bucks. How much did this cost us? Uh, that was uh, 99 uh, Hong Kong dollars. Which is about was... 10 bucks. It, yeah, it's, it's about, well, it's about $12, but yeah. still, it's 
five meters five flat. Meter HDMI flat cable. HDMI 1.4. And it's rated to run 4K. Yeah. So it's a lot of really cool stuff. It's time to go to the camera market right now and see what goes on over there. And um, I'll leave you guys with uh, some of this footage from the, from the trip. Oh, yeah.